So this very important video looks at natural selection and speciation. Now obviously natural selection is a mechanism of evolution. So evolution change in a gene pool over time or change in the characteristics of a population over time. Natural selection was developed by Darwin as a mechanism to understand evolution. So how does evolution actually happen? What causes those changes or drives those changes? Natural selection was his uh, theory on that. And then that leads to the formation of different species, which is what we call speciation. So uh, let's have a look with our uh, modern eyes with, through an understanding of genotype and phenotype, how that works, which is what Darwin wasn't able to do because he uh, genetics were not developed at that time. So as you know, uh, homologous chromosomes come in pairs with uh, genes in homologous locations and these different versions we call alleles. Uh, the particular alleles that an individual has uh, are called their genotype and this will, uh, through a combination of those gene versions and then other uh, things in the environment will lead to the phenotype or the physical outcome or, or the behaviour of the animal. So in this case, we might have the white peppered moth or the black version of the peppered moth. That physical trait uh, will either be adaptive and increase the chance of reproductive success of that individual or will be maladaptive and uh, lead to its decreased success. So obviously in this case, the black phenotype has a better camouflage and these uh, ones are more likely to survive and reproduce. Therefore, by reproducing, they're passing on the uh, the alleles, the versions of the genes that give them this trait, onto their offspring more likely. And so they're more likely to have uh, the uh, black variant children, uh, offspring, uh, and the white variant is going to decrease in the population. And so that leads to changes in genotype within that population, which will be acted on uh, by natural selection as it comes as phenotype and lead back to further changes of genotype. So they will have a change in the frequency of the allele that leads to the light phenotype and that's what we call evolution. Change in the gene pool, which is the sum of all the different frequencies and alleles, change in the gene pool over time with each population. So back to Darwin though, how did he uh, arise at this understanding of natural selection without even understanding genetics? So the uh, background is that um, one of the key insights uh, that was happening at the time was understanding that the earth was a lot older older than originally thought. So Principles of Geology uh, by Lyle was a book that Darwin read as a young man and it talked about geological time, thousands and thousands of years, hundreds of thousands of years, millions of years for the earth to go through its geological processes. This was at odds with the Bible that said that the earth was about 5,000 years old and didn't allow time for evolution to happen by those small gradual changes uh, generation by generation. This understanding of geology led Darwin to think that uh, evolution could have happened over a much longer time span and allowed for that idea of gradual change by each generation uh, to happen. The other key uh, thing that he read was a principle on population by Thomas Malthus, which said um, in relation to humans, um, that we breed more uh, than the number that survive. In that time, a family might have 12 children, perhaps only two survived into adulthood and then had uh, further children. So there was an idea that um, there was a struggle for life and that only some individuals would survive to pass on their genes to the next generation. Uh, Darwin started to wonder about how there's selection of which survive and which don't survive. Uh, then obviously he had the voyage on the Beagle uh, and 30 years after that voyage, putting all these ideas together, he published On the Origin of Species by Means of Natural Selection, in which he argued that new species arise because of this process of selection by nature. It says preservation of the favoured races in the struggle for life. So the idea that not everyone is going to survive and reproduce in that struggle for life, those variants which have uh, the best adaptations for their environment are likely to be preserved and lead their genes onto the next generation, leading to evolution and adaptation, which leads to the formation of new species. And that's what we're going to talk about in the rest of the video. So his uh, concept is summarised in this four uh, diagrams here. 
that within every population there is variation, there is competition for resources uh, for these caterpillars to turn into these butterflies. Uh, by adaptation, the ones that are most well suited to their environment, in this case the camouflaged caterpillars, are more likely to survive and reproduce. Therefore, within this variation, the brown variant is positively selected and they will reproduce more and you will end up with more brown butterflies. Whereas the more colourful one is selected against uh, and these will reduce their frequency within the population. And this for again, starting off at 50-50, leading to 80% uh, brown, change in the population over time is what we call evolution. Um, another way, another example of this might be around you have variation in the population here. Some of the deer have thicker coats. Uh, a small number of these get separated from the population and end up in a cold mountain climate. And here the selection pressure will be to develop the thicker coats. And we can see again a change in the frequency of thick coats. So there's a low frequency of the thick coat allele initially leading to a high frequency over here. Um, if these are separate populations uh, that we're seeing a genetic difference between this population of deer and these ones. And so although they might start as the same species, they're headed towards being two different species. And this is what Darwin argued is the basis of speciation or the formation or origin of species. So how does that work? You start off with an initial original population, and we can think about this as a gene pool. Some geographic barrier, like the mountain, creates a separation between those two populations. And so they are geographically separated by this barrier, and you end up with two separate gene pools. By adaptation um, or genetic drift, they have an increasing number of genetic differences between these two, so they get to the point where if you remember, we looked at reproductive isolating mechanisms. As they get to a point where there are post-zygotic reproductive isolating mechanisms, that mean that even if they were to have no geographic barrier anymore, and they could uh, potentially interbreed with each other, they're now so genetically different that they cannot have fertile offspring. And then we call them two separate species. So there is a process before we have full reproductive isolation where we could perhaps reintroduce those species and they can form a gene pool again. But you get to a certain point where they're so different they can no longer um, participate in the same gene pool. When it happens uh, due to a geographic isolation we call that allopatric speciation which means different regions or areas. So uh, patriotism or your country, your country, uh, Compatriots, all those sort of words are derived from patri meaning country or area. So in a different area, um, if the speciation occurs through a separation, we call that allopatric. If it occurs within the same area, that we call that sympatric speciation. Now this doesn't happen very often. But sometimes you can get speciation happening without a geographic uh, barrier in between, just through to a, uh, a large genetic shift that produces reproductive isolation. This happens more often in plants, uh, so it's not very common for animals to undergo this process. So now that we have those basics, I just want to go through some of the clear things about human evolution and some of those misconceptions that we need to look into. So many people think, uh, and this diagram just reinforces it, that chimpanzees led to early hominids, led to Neanderthals, led to uh, modern humans, and that we evolved from these monkeys or apes. And so they ask questions like, well, if we evolved from apes, why are there still apes around the place? Haven't they evolved into humans? And um, this linear process is completely wrong and is something that I want to try to clarify with you now. So rather than a linear process like this, what we're talking about is that humans and chimpanzees and apes evolved from a common ancestor. So we all came from a common ancestor and are the living relatives of that uh, ancestor today. And it looks a little bit like this. So if we're just looking at humans, don't worry too much about the apes and others, uh, is the idea that there was a population of humans in Africa. So this is not a phylogenetic tree. This is more looking at the spread of human species across the different parts of the world against time. So there was a small population of the early human species, Homo ergaster, um, in Africa which was able to spread throughout Africa and then through the Southeast Asia as well. 
Now here we have a process of geographic isolation. So this species, um, Homo ergaster, ended up as uh, Homo erectus in the Asian areas and um, Homo uh, heidelbergensis in Africa. And so due to the geographic isolation, uh, they split into different species, uh, which were no longer uh, physically similar. Uh, within Asia, uh, because of the many islands and things like that, they were able to split again through geographic isolation. In fact, this species, Homo floresiensis, on the island of Flores, was on a very small island, a small population that didn't have a large geographic range. It actually uh, lasted quite a long time before they were wiped out by Homo sapiens. So, uh, in Africa and, and Europe, one of the first groups to leave Africa uh, evolved into the Neanderthals, Homo neanderthalensis, um, which uh, spread across Europe before again being um, taken over by Homo sapiens. There's some discussion about perhaps interbreeding between these, so they weren't totally separate species, there was some hybrid ability. So this is that case of perhaps some stage, if there hasn't been enough genetic difference, that some populations can back, come back together and interbreed. But basically, uh, at a certain time, about you know, 0.4 million years ago, you had one, two, three, four, five, six different species of humans existing at the same time, all uh, with this common ancestor of the um, African hominid Homo ergaster. But because of their geographic separation across the planet, they had evolved along separate lines. Eventually, though, um, the Homo sapiens, due to uh, adaptations that allowed them to uh, outlive all of the other human species, uh, took over around um, 60 to 100,000 years ago. And uh, basically, not quite sure whether they wiped out the other ones, um, but ended up spreading across the entire planet, and no other species of humans exist today. Um, but yeah, here's our family, and it's interesting to consider what would have been the case in that uh, 400,000 years ago, for instance, where we had uh, up to six different species of humans living at the same time. What would they have done when they encountered each other? What would it be like if we had even just one or two other species of humans living today?